Hospital Hepatology Webinar. That is uh, Professor uh, Yasito Tanaka. I think the uh, Professor Tanaka is well known uh, in our uh, regions, and uh, he is now uh, the professor uh, at the uh, Department of uh, Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Kumamoto uh, University. Uh, he has uh, uh, worked in this field for uh, many years and uh, published many innovative uh, studies in the field of HBB, HCV, and hepatocerocarcinoma. So uh, today uh, he will uh, give us the very interesting and important uh, topic that is about the uh, novel uh, biomarkers uh, for the management of uh, chronic plus B. So uh, Professor Tanaka, please. I think uh, he will, uh, we will play the video. Hello everyone. My name is Yasuhito Tanaka, Kumamoto University. I am very happy to give me the opportunity to have my presentation here. I'd like to talk about novel biomarker for the management of chronic hepatitis B. This is my disclosure here. Today's my topic is clinical usefulness of conventional HB correlated anti Highly sensitive ITAC HB CLAG assay. New anti HBB compound HBB RNA destabilizer. HBB serum marker have HBB DNA, HBS antigen, and overlapped HBB correlated antigen. HBB DNA was detected by real time PCR. HBS antigen and HBCLAG were detected by CLEIA. These viral particles are produced from CCC DNA in liver. Serum HBCLAG and HBS antigen produced from CCC DNA. HBCRAG reflects the transcriptional activity of intrahepatic CCC DNA more accurately than QHBS antigen. Because Q antigen, HBS antigen produce not only CCC DNA but also integrated HBB DNA. HBS CRAG assay detected HBB core protein E antigen as well as empty particles including P22CL encoded with a pre-core core region. This slide shows good correlation between HBCLAG and HBB DNA level in patient without treatment by each HBB genotype A to F. Interestingly, optimal cutoff value of HBCLAG was 3.6 log unit per mile to diagnose HBB DNA level of 2,000 I per mile, as well as 4.5 and 5.3 to 20,000 I per mile HBB DNA and 200,000 I per mile of DNA respectively. So interestingly, HBB CLAG might be alternative marker for HBB DNA in developing country. Serum HBCLAG correlated with CCC DNA level in liver better than serum HBB RNA and HBS antigen regardless of E antigen status. As well as different inflammatory grading or serum HBB DNA level. Until now, Several papers from Japan and Asian countries describe the prediction of HCC development by HBCLAG assay. This will show incidence of HCC development according to serial HBCLAG level. In overall or integrable treated group, patients with persistent high untreated HBCLAG level were more likely to develop HCC despite sustained viral suppression by a long-term nuke therapy, suggesting that HBCLAG might be alternative marker for HBB DNA during nuke therapy. So summary first, 
HBCRAG was correlated with HBB DNA as well as CCC DNA in liver. Persistent high HBCRAG level have been significantly associated with the risk of progression of occurrent or recurrent of hepatocellular carcinoma. So clinical questions here. To predict the effect of NUC or CAM cause assembly moderator therapy, is HBCRAG assay useful for the clinical practice? How about the senti sensitivity? Cut off line, three log unit per mile is enough for clinical practice? So, natural cause HBB infection. Immunotolerant phase HBB DNA high but LT normal. Immunoclearance phase LT elevation and HBE antigen cell conversion, followed by inactive phase. The current indication of anti-HBB therapy is E antigen positive or E antigen negative active hepatitis. This ratio shows discrepancy between HBCL, AG, and HBB DNA during NUC therapy. That way, the HBB DNA level will rapidly reduce, but HBB CRAG becomes undetectable in limited patients. Some patients still positive for drawing nuke therapy. So during nuke therapy, then particles were reduced. But newly HBB RNA particles were produced and HBCRAG has, has been detectable. Capsid assembly moderator CAM can disrupt multiple steps required for HBB replication and persistent. You can see recycle inhibit in resulting in inhibit of the normal CCC DNA formation. So interesting capsid assembly moderator reduce HBB RNA and DNA resulting in reduction of HBCRAG. HBCRAG assay would be useful for monitoring the relapse of such drugs. So again, there were good correlation between HBB DNA and HBCRAG regardless ENG positive and negative. But conventional HBCRAG become undetectable in some HB E antigen negative patient. So sensitivity is not enough for clinical practice. So summary nuc therapy then particles are reduced, but produce RNA particle undetectable HBCRAG. Capsid assembly moderator both then particle and RNA particle are reduced, resulting in reduction of HBCRAG during treatment. HBCRAG assay would be useful for monitoring of CAM therapy if sensitivity improved. So I move to high sensitive ITACT HBCRAG assay. This paper is published in last year in Journal Hepatology. So clinical efficacy of novel high sensitive ITACT HBCRAG assay. HBB particle and E antigen antibody in the complex were disrupted by pretreated process. And also anti HBE and anti HBC antibody were inactivated. After pretreated process, a novel HB ITACT HBCRAG assay showed distinguished difference from background, and then error Q is improved around 10 times. So cutoff line right now 2.1 log unit per mile. This this assay is automatically so it's important it takes only 35 minutes to detect HBCRAG automatically on board. Comparison between the rate of HBCRAG detection by ITAC HBCRAG versus G conventional HBCRAG in sample from nuc treated therapy. The current HBCRAG undetectable in cell of more than 25%. 
But I took the HBC array G. High sensitive assay is only undetectable in the cellar 2.5%, suggesting highly sensitive iDACT HBC array Z more useful for clinical practice even in antigen negative patient. So comparison assay result various HPV biomarker from serial species obtained from over time from 13 patients who develop HPV reactivation. This point is HPV, HPV DNA detectable. Interestingly, 9 and 2 of 13 HPV reactivation patients were HBCLAG positive by ITACT HBCLAG assay before and at HPV DNA positive respectively. So interestingly, regardless of the patient with deactivation, ITACT HBCLAG was detectable earlier than HPV DNA and high sensitive HBS antigen assay. So what particle detected by IDACT HBCLAG? At 133 days before HBB DNA detectable. So this point, HBB DNA undetectable, E antigen undetectable, HBS antigen undetectable. Only empty particle is detected by assay. So at 49 days after HBB DNA detection, HBB DNA also detectable, E antigen positive, S antigen positive. So at this point, empty particle as well, billion particle are detectable. So suggesting empty particle produced by CCC DNA as a main component of HBCLAG detected early in the activation. So next, we examine ITAC HBCL regime among 27 additional patients. Patient flow diagram and baseline characteristics of 27 patients with HBB reactivated who have prior resolved HBB infection. So in this cohort, eight patients stopped nuke therapy. So of the 27 patients, only 52% were positive for HBS and GHQ. But 96% were positive for ITAC HBCLAG at or after HBB reactivation, suggesting that ITAC HBCLAG was much higher sensitive than HBSAG HQ. The median duration from nuke therapy to ITAC HBCLAG loss over the last follow up was 175 days. That was longer than median duration from nuke treated to undetectable HBB DNA as well as HBS antigen. So time course of HBB DNA, ITACT HBCLAG and HBS antigen loses after nuke treatment in 27 patients with HBB reactivation. So seven patients with low or Undetectable HBCLAG safely stop nuke therapy. I think the other patient undetectable ITACT HBCLAG will stop nuke therapy also. So summary three, ITACT HBCLAG assay is fully automated and tenfold higher sensitivity, more than 2.1 log unit per mile. So useful for monitoring HPE antigen negative chronic hepatitis B and HPV reactivation. For HPV reactivation, ITACT HBCLAG was detectable earlier and longer than HPV DNA and higher sensitive HBS antigen, possibly criteria for nuke cessation. Finally, we move to new anti-HPV compound RNA destabilizer. A novel anti-HPV compound, sub-compound, reduce HPV RNA by destabilization. So this will show in vitro anti-HPV profile sub-compound. Sub-compound reduce HPV DNA and HB 
S and J in both HEPD2 cell and PXB cell with IC50 in nanomora. Also, this activity show anti-HBB activity against multiple genotype ACD. So we studying in vivo efficacies. So efficacy using chimeric mice with human hepatocyte. So this is chronic HBB infective model. We orally administrated sub compound in chronic HBB mouse. So by in vivo chimeric mice model, sub compound reduce HBB DNA and HBS antigen. The minimum effective dose of subcompound is 6 mg per kg per day BID. So interestingly, subcompound considerably in suppress HBB RNA. So effect of subcompound add-on treated to entecabue in the PXB mouse. By the combination treatment with SARC and NTKB, serum HBB DNA rapidly reduced, as well as HBS antigen reduced immediately, but not reduced HBS antigen by NTKB treatment. So interestingly, the combination is very useful for clinical practice to reduce HBS antigen. Studying RNA destabilization by brick assay. After BRU in pulse, we examine whether sub compound influence RNA destabilization or not. By the brick assay, sub compound destabilize HBB RNA, but not gap DH and human alubumin. Next, after separating nucleus and cytoplasma, we conducted the brick assay again. Interestingly, subcompound destabilized HBB RNA predominantly in nucleus compared to in the cytoplasma. This slide shows subcompound mode of action. We conducted polyethyl assay. So sub compound destabilize HBB RNA specifically. To elucidate the toxicity of sub compound, we conducted two week repeated overdose toxicity of sub compound in monkeys. Sub compound show no about toxicity in monkeys. No, the noir of subcompound was 1,000 mg per kilogram per day. This is live safety margin. So based on histopathological examination of two weeks repeated of oral toxicity study in monkeys, so no change of all organs such as liver, kidney, and nerve was observed. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, cell compound reduce HBB DNA and HBS antigen in both hep 2 cell and PXB cells, showed anti-HBB activity against multiple genotypes, genotype A to C to D, reduce viral markers, HBB DNA, HBS antigen, and correlated antigen in vitro and in vivo. So cell compound destabilize HBB DNA RNA predominantly nucleus compared to the inside plasma. Okay, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, uh, Professor Tanaka. Now I would like to invite Professor Sarin uh, to introduce the next speakers, Professor uh, PJ Chen. Professor Sarin, please. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me. 
to join this very prestigious hepatitis B uh, webinar. And I have pleasure of introducing one of our very close and respected friends, Professor P.J. Chen, whom I have known for a couple of decades. Professor Chen is a distinguished chair professor at the National Taiwan University. He is also the director of Department of Research and has several honors to his credit. With 650 publications to uh, his credit now, uh, we have a unique opportunity of a man who is bestowed with so much knowledge. He has an actual transfer to clinical trials to epidemiology. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to invite Professor Physiology and Evolving Therapies for Hepatitis D. Professor Chen, please. Dear guest and uh, APASO member, it is my pleasure and honor to deliver a talk in this webinar. My presentation will cover the changing epidemiology and the evolving therapies for chronic hepatitis D. Here's my disclosure. As shown by the WHO uh, before, the hepatitis mortality is increasing in the recent uh, decade. decade. As, as you can note it, uh, the, uh, the, the death toll due to the uh, hepatitis increasing from year 2000 to year uh, 2015. And the 90% of hepatitis related deaths, namely cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, are coming from chronic viral hepatitis infection. Uh, in this case, hepatitis C is about uh, 60 million uh, patients worldwide and the hepatitis B is more, and about 240 million in the worldwide. Uh, among the chronic hepatitis B group, uh, there is a subgroup deserve our attention. Here, this is uh, hepatitis D. Hepatitis D uh, virus is a satellite RNA virus OHBV and uh, less known in our communities. Uh, the virus has a unique genome, but requiring HPV service antigen for assembly and the infection. Here is the, the cartoon showing the HPV structure. The HPV RNA is a RNA virus, uh, but the, it's, it's capsule and the, uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, the envelope actually are composed the, uh, the hep hepatitis B uh, service antigen uh, from the HPV virus. So the HPV is a virus with RNA genome that can replicate by themselves. However, they cannot uh, release out of the infected cell unless the, pre the co-presence of the HPV to provide the service antigen for their assembly and the release. So here is an uh, <coughs> electron microscopy picture for the hepatitis data virus. And you can see there's in the same, uh, same picture, you can note it, the presence of many uh, empty HBS antigen particle. So uh, HTV infection is usually happen in the chronic hepatitis B patient and the result to the chronic hepatitis data. So how are hepatitis data virus infected? In, in, uh, among hepatitis B carrier. Uh, our previous uh, study in Taiwan showed uh, the risk factor for the HDV infection among HBV carrier. The most important one is uh, uh, injection, injection drug abuse, indicating the parental route. Parental route of transmission are very important. 
in addition, the HIV infect, co-infection or HCV co-infection also uh, a risk factor. Again, all uh, this risk factor suggesting the HTV transfection uh, infection are likely transmitted through the parental pathway. And how, how much the disease load for the hepatitis D? The, here is the previous uh, estimation. Uh, approximately about 4.5% to 13% of HPS antigen passive carrier are co-infected with HTV. Uh, there are two estimations, one based, based upon uh, analysis of prevalence in six WHO region. Uh, the, the number is about uh, 12 million uh, hepatitis D patients. Another estimate from the meta-analysis of public, published data uh, come up with about 40, 48 to 60 million hepatitis D patients globally. However, these are the uh, data derived from previous uh, uh, epidemiology study, but the, the situation may change in the recently. <clears throat> the major uh, driving force for the changing epidemiology of HDV is, is actually uh, the universal HPV vaccination uh, in launched in the year uh, uh, 1980 80 years. So after the uh, HPV vaccination, it's, this is not only uh, broke the HPV infection, but also HDV. Therefore, a declining of the HDV uh, in, the, in the general population is very likely. So our uh, study about the HDV infection in Taiwan from the reveal HVV cohort uh, <coughs> conducted in year around 2000. Uh, in this uh, epidemiology study, we found uh, among uh, uh, three uh, uh, three thousand and twenty uh, twenty hundred subject of the HPV carrier, uh, sixty nine subject were HPV zero positive, so the prevalence rate is about two point one three in the community cohort. A more recent uh, survey in uh, conducted in Taiwan in the hospital uh, uh, patient, and and the rate is even lower is only 1.15% among the HBS antigen carrier. Therefore, the HDV disease load in the recent days probably much lower than a previous estimate, estimate, estimate. We suggest around three to five million cases of the HDV worldwide after the universal vaccination. So the disease load is decreasing in the recent years. But how important of the HDV co-infection uh, in clinically? Uh, in summary, HDV co-infection may lead to a worse outcome than HPV carrier, uh, carriers alone. Here is our uh, recent study in analysis. The HB, HDV patient uh, in the review HPV cohort among the reveal HPV carrier, uh, the, <coughs> the group HDV negative is HB, hepatitis B carrier alone. HDV positive is, is hepatitis D and hepatitis B. And the follow-up suggested uh, the development of the HCC risk in the HDV uh, co-infected group is about one point, uh, it's about two, two uh, uh, very close to two. two. And the same analysis for the development of the cirrhosis again come up with a risk about two, uh, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two fold than the uh, HPV carrier alone. A recent meta analysis of the HCC risk in chronic hepatitis patient, hepatitis D patient, in compared to the hepatitis B patient, again the result is very similar. The re the risk is two, uh, two times four than the uh, uh, HBV carrier alone. Therefore, in among the HBV 
uh, chronic hepatitis B subgroup, the HDV uh, <coughs> population pro probably fell worse than uh, than uh, HV, uh, chronic hepatitis B alone. Therefore, they are they really need to be uh, taken care and uh, looking for better therapies. And the target for the current all new hepatitis D therapy, including the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the time owner interferon alpha or lambda. Uh, after the, uh, they stimulate the interferon stimulated gene, then suppress the HDV uh, re replication and the viral load. In addition to the interferon, a recent uh, a new drug is is uh, <coughs> bulivertide. This is a small peptide that uh, block the the uh, the receptor for the HBV and HDV, so that <coughs> the bulivertide can prevent the HDV new infection. Another one is ronafenib. Ronafenib uh, is a, a enzyme inhibitor. In uh, uh, Farnesia transferase inhibit broke the uh, the fanisnation uh, of the large data antigen and prevent the virus HDV uh, production and the release. Mm -hmm. And finally, there is a recent nucleic acid polymer. This poly this polymer uh, is a phosphosilylate uh, uh, polymer. And the polymer uh, working properly through the inhibition of the uh, HVV service antigen particle and the trigger uh, a new and immune or antiviral mechanism. So the hepatitis data therapy today and today, it, some of the patient, hepatitis patient, actually receive the anti HBV nucleoside analog for the underlying chronic hepatitis B activity. However, however, such treatment are not sufficiently effective in suppressing HDV activity. And interferon is more effective therapy at the present and, and uh, curing about 10 to 20 percent of hepatitis D. This is mean HDV RNA clearance, but not yet approved. Recently, bulivertide is was con, uh, is conditionally approved by the EMA uh, for the for the treatment of chronic hepatitis D patient. So, uh, so the, so the drug uh, bulivertide uh, has been applied in uh, in uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, and here is a real life uh, real world uh, uh, result about the bulivertide treatment for the chronic hepatitis C uh, for toward a combined response endpoint. This means the undetectable HDV RNA or more than two log uh, uh, IU uh, decline or, HD, or HDV RNA plus um, ART normalization. So uh, bulivertide alone uh, achieved pretty good uh, and uh, combined endpoint and, and even better than the interferon uh, in combination with bulivertide. However, uh, this is a, a surrogate marker. If you look at the, the more sustainable marker, the HDV RNA clearance, so the, the bulivertide alone, the clearance rate is only about 6 to 10 percent. In contrast, interferon plus bulivertide, the response rate can up to 20, 24 to 34 percent. Therefore, <coughs> uh, the, the hepatitis data treatment, we may need to consider uh, a combination therapy of the bulivertide plus interferon. The another, another very interesting therapy is the NAP plus the pegylated interferon for the chronic hepatitis D that it, here is the chemical structure of the NAP. Uh, <coughs> this, this is a nucleic acid polymer and combined together. And if they are uh, given together 
with the interferon. And here's a, here's a, a, a early clinical trial. So the combination of, the, of this NAP together with the interferon. You, you, you can observe there's a rapid declining of the HDV RNA in many in most of the case, and despite some of the relapse. And more and very important, uh, that they are uh, many of the patients uh, become the anti HBS zero conversion. Therefore, about one third of the uh, hepatitis C patient treat, treated by this regimen become cured. So this is this is a very interesting uh, <coughs> regimen deserves our attention. The other ongoing uh, phase three trial for the hepatitis delta virus, uh, including the uh, polyvertide uh, role, and now the, now there there are inter interim analysis indicating a pretty uh, a promising result. Another study is is uh, plus we don't know if we are uh, with in combination with interferon or not. And the study are also ongoing. We are interested to, to see the eventual outcome. However, interferon may be still needed for a sustained viral response of the hepatitis in the hepatitis D. So finally, I would like to introduce you a new novel extra long acting interferon, namely ROPEG interferon. As you know, the previous uh, uh, peg Pegasus uh, is also a pegylate in interferon. However, <coughs> this uh, new ROPEG interferon different from Pegasus. It's, it's, uh, it's a very uh, single and exactly uh, pegylation on, this, on the interferon. Here's, here's a, a, a picture showing uh, the the the, the ROPEG interferon structure. This is this is uh, the interferon alpha two B, and uh, through the uh, genetic engineering, uh, <coughs> one protein is is insert at the first amino acid of this interferon, and through this uh, protein, the pegylate uh, the pegylation was added. So showing here, therefore, the peg interferon differ from the Pegasus. There is only one uh, pegylation site of this uh, <coughs> this 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 interferon, and uh, and uh, therefore it is quite uh, homogeneous. And in addition, this uh, this uh, uh, this is a peg interferon recently has been approved by. USA, FDA, and the EMA for polycythemia viral therapy. And the, and the ROPEG interferon, the, P, the pharmacokinetics, as shown, as shown in this figure, in, in, the, this, uh, the, the purple line is a PK for the ROPEG interferon in 440 milligram. And here, this, this is orange one, is the uh, Pegasus. Therefore, it is quite clear the PK uh, of the opaque interferon is 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 uh, more sustained and prolonged than the than the Pegasus. Therefore, the drug can be interferon can be given once two weeks or even once four we in four weeks. And recently, we also test the opaque interferon alpha two B in chronic hepatitis C patient. And the result is showing the SVR rate is very close uh, between uh, a peg interferon alpha two alpha two A and uh, and uh, no peg interferon alpha two B with uh, e equivalent uh, efficacy and uh, the better uh, safety uh, of the no peg interferon in chronic hepatitis C patient. So it can be used uh, in the chronic hepatitis C in the future. So the prospect for the uh, hepatitis data is we need to raise, it, raise awareness of HDV uh, examination in the in, among chronic hepatitis B patients. However, we we still need approved HDV diagnosis assay, including the serologic and uh, 
uh, NASA. Both are pending. And we, we have to be careful about the wider variation of HDV epidemiology in different uh, geographical areas and the risk group. And one uh, uh, important future is, is after the HPV vaccination program implemented, the, the, the hepatitis D patients uh, are most in the age group. And so their treatment may be different from the younger uh, active uh, uh, hepatitis uh, B patient. And we, so we need the regimen more effective to improve the clinical outcome. In this situation, the combination of the small molecule with the interferon may be needed. Finally, because the, the hepatitis D patient among the hepatitis B carrier uh, prevalence rate is low. Therefore, we need to establish a network so we can conclude them, uh, can, can recruit more patients and conduct efficient and, and meaningful clinical study to, uh, to resolve the, the challenge of chronic hepatitis D in the future. So thank you for uh, your attention, and I am happy to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor P.J. Chen. It was a pleasure uh, listening to you and the new drugs, and I was very happy to see the new data on blueberry tide on uh, hepatitis D and also the use of RAP301 follow-up data on this. Uh, maybe if, I'm not sure whether questions we can take right now or later, uh, but if there are any questions, uh, uh, we can take it now. Uh, I have one question to Professor Chen. Yes. Uh, we normally have uh, HBV as CCC DNA. Yes. Uh, and even if HBV DNA is negative, yes. we have, uh, we continue antiviral because of HBSAG being positive. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a combined Delta and B infection, yes. where HBSAG is positive, but HBV DNA is negative and hepatitis delta RNA is also negative. Mm -hmm. Yes. So would you continue in that patient who is DNA, HBV DNA and HDV negative, but HBSAG is still four logs, five logs. So will you give antiviral for hepatitis delta? That's, that's a good, good question. So I in 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 in, my, in this situation, I I personally I don't think the uh, uh, anti anti HBV virus uh, anti uh, nuke is 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 beneficial. We probably to to have to consider the other 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 one, other one, other one, other one is especially the 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 drug can enhance. Yeah, immune, immune, immunity of the patient. Because when you stop the, the nukes for hepatitis B, yes, there is a, in E minus also there is a risk of mm. uh, you know relapse maybe in uh, seventy percent, sixty percent cases. Right. So if it relapses, delta may also relapse. So that is, I did not know this data. I thought you may guide us. I, 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 we are trying to understand, to explore this, this, this question in the future. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay. Maybe Professor Lin can proceed. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sarin. And did you, do, uh, does Professor Nguyen log on? It seemed to me that uh, she doesn't log on to the web webinar. So it's okay, I will uh, introduce Professor Anna Locke. And I think uh, Professor Locke uh, need not to introduce, she's so famous, a well-renowned scholar in the study of hepatitis B. And briefly, uh, Professor Locke was graduated in from the University of Hong Kong and uh, 
with uh, hepatology fellowship in Royal Fury Hospital in London, and then she moved to University of Michigan. She is a world-renowned scholar in the study of hepatitis B and this has many publications, and she's now the professor of uh, hepatology in University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. So let's welcome uh, Professor Locke for his talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be able to join you, um, and hopefully I get this all set up. Um, it's a pleasure to be with um, everyone. Um, and um, my task is to um, provide an update on new drug development for hepatitis B cure. So these are my financial disclosures. And I'll be talking about how we define cure, what are the antiviral therapies in development, and how we're gonna combine them together in the hope of achieving hepatitis B cure. Um, when we achieve a high success rate with hepatitis C DAA, Everyone was very excited. Uh, and we're hoping that we can also find a cure for hepatitis B. Now, ideally, when we talk about cure, we want to completely get rid of um, all the virus, a sterilizing um, cure, but this is unlikely to be possible for hepatitis B. So at a 2017 ASLD ESO conference, uh, we decided that um, we should be more realistic um, and therefore um, went with functional cure which would be similar to someone with chronic hepatitis B with either spontaneous S antigen loss um, or S antigen loss after nuke or interferon therapy. These patients would be service antigen negative. However, they would still have um, hepatitis B DNA in the liver uh, in the form of CCC DNA or integrated HBV DNA, even though the virus transcription might be inactive. Um, the liver inflammation would have subsided and fibrosis would regress over time. But we think that um, the liver, um, the XCC risk would be decreasing and yet not completely eliminated. So this is what was um, decided um, at the 2017 and the 2019 um, SLD-ESO conference, where functional cure was defined as undetectable surface antigen and HBV DNA in the blood for at least six months after completion of a finite course of treatment. The mood at that time was, we really need to go to a finite duration of treatment, otherwise we can just um, stay with um, long-term new therapy. At a time we assumed that if we silence CCC DNA transcription, uh, we'll for sure stop service antigen production. However, it turns out that we were wrong uh, because we now understand that there are two sources of service antigen, the CCC DNA, which is the predominant source in Yenogen positive patients, and integrated HBV DNA, the predominant source in Yenogen negative patients. And thus, if we were to achieve um, S antigen loss in a high proportion of patients, we would also need to eliminate integrated HBV DNA. And at the moment, um, the therapies um, are not clear whether this mode of um, action is possible or not. So when we think of um, strategies for hepatitis B cure, most experts would agree that first, we need to suppress virus replication. And there are multiple compounds, classes of compounds that might achieve that purpose. Um, the entry inhibitors, the newts, the caps assembly modulators, the siRNA and the antisense oligos. We also need to be able to decrease service antigen production. Uh, and here, the siRNA and the antisense oligos are probably the most effective. Uh, we've heard about the nuclear exit polymers. They also, um, they don't actually reduce the production, but they reduce the secretion. Um, interferon may also participate in reducing the production. And certainly, you can also use some anti-service um, antibody um, to clear service antigen or therapeutic vaccines. It's still debated whether immune modulatory therapy is necessary or necessary for all patients, and whether some patients would have recovery of immune response by just suppressing virus replication and reducing service antigen. We have less success with immune modulatory therapies right now, but there are multiple modalities in development. Um, the innate term response, um, the toll light receptor agonist, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, and various um, B and T cell um, therapeutic vaccines, and maybe interferon still has a role. I'll start by talking about the siRNA or the antisense. 
Um, the main purpose here is to interfere with um, reverse transcription of um, the pregenomic RNA, as well as the um, translation of messenger RNA. And in so doing, uh, we would be able to decrease the production of variants and viral proteins, and by decreasing surface tension, may also restore immune response. Well, does it actually work? Well, this is one of the early studies um, of an siRNA. Um, and it's very impressive because I'm here with just some three doses, you get about a two log decline in service engine in some patients, and everyone actually achieved at least a one log decline. But what is most impressive is even stopping after stopping treatment, some patients have durable S engine reduction lasting for up to nine months. At a time, everyone was very optimistic and thought that if we were just to add a few more doses, we'll be able to clear service engine very quickly. But this did not turn out to be the case because this is another study of um, a different Galnet siRNA. And here the patients were actually dosed for up to 48 weeks. Yes, you do get a very impressive rapid drop in S engine within the first some eight to 12 weeks, but then there's a plateau despite continued dosing. And it's still not clear why this is the case. And in this particular study, despite dosing up to 48 weeks, none of the patients lost S engine. However, in some of the patients, but not in all, when you have a marker reduction in S engine level, there is a recovery of HPV specific T cell response. Now, whether that's sufficient to over time clear surface engine remains to be determined, but clearly it shows that immune recovery can occur, but it may not occur in every single patient. Because siRNA um, did not seem to be effective on its own to result in clearance of surface engine, various additional combinations have been tried. Uh, and this is some data presented just a couple of weeks ago at the ASLD liver meeting, where one siRNA, the VER2218, was combined with um, pegylator interferon. Here they tried different strategies, the siRNA alone, starting the PEC interferon um, halfway um, through the siRNA therapy, starting at the same time, but for a short period of time, only PEC interferon for 24 weeks, or extending the PEC interferon up to 48 weeks, or both the siRNA and the PEC later interferon um, up to 44 to 48 weeks. So thus um, adding PEC later interferon work. Well, you can see that um, at a 24 week time point, which is when the patients receive either the siRNA alone or in combination with pegylate interferon. There did appear to be a very small incremental effect, um, increasing from 1.9 log um, decline to maybe up to 2.3, 2.4 log, but not terribly impressive. Now, the color red cohort 5 had the most um, drop in service engine up to week 48. But this is because in this particular group, the siRNA and the pegylate interferon all went um, all the way to week 48. However, in this particular study, uh, we don't really know what happened after treatment is stopped. And as you can see here at week 48, they did have a couple of patients uh, with undetectable surface antigen, more so in cohort four and cohort five. So cohort four, um, the siRNA for 24 weeks, but pegylate interferon for 48 weeks, cohort five, both siRNA um, and um, pegylate interferon all the way to the end. Follow-up would be very important to determine if the S engine loss is um, sustained, um, and obviously larger number of um, patients would need to be studied. Well, another strategy is um, a different combination. And here, the same siRNA, VER2218, is combined with um, VER3434. This is actually a monoclonal antibody, but it's not just an antibody to mop up circulating S antigen, because it has engineered FC region, which increases engagement of antigen presenting cells. So it possibly also can stimulate um, T cells and have a vaccine effect. And this was um, certainly shown to be the case in vitro, whether that happens in vivo or not is not clear. So does this combination work? Well, the first um, look at VER3434 as a monotherapy in one single dose. This is actually interesting because um, here, with just one single dose, in orange, you see a drop in surface antigen 
um, almost um, too long, but also a drop in um, HPV DNA. So it's not just mopping up circulating as engine, but you also get a drop in HPV DNA, although the effect of one single dose is, as you would expect, very transient. Well, what if you give it for a longer period of time? And again, this is some data presented um, a couple of weeks ago at the liver meeting. Um, in these two groups, they received the um, VER218 um, as well as um, the um, uh, VER3434 in different doses. Um, the two doses are actually fairly similar. Um, you get a sharp bump drop in the S engine and then a very slow decline. Now in the orange is different because I'm here the siRNA is continued all the way to the end. Um, although you can see that um, despite continuing dosing of the siRNA, um, you don't see a sharp drop until you add on the VER3438, uh, 3434, um, the monoclonal antibody. So here the addition of um, the monoclonal antibody led to rapid decrease in surface antigen levels, um, followed by a slower decline with continued dosing. Most participants achieved S antigen decline to less than 10 IU per ml at the end of treatment, but still none of them achieved S antigen loss. Now, what's not clear in this um, study is whether some of the um, S antigen might be bound to immune complex. Um, that's why um, it seemed that um, there's a sharp decline and that remains to be resolved. Perhaps the most exciting is the data on the antisense oligonucleotide, and this is um, currently impressed in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this is a GSK naked antisense oligonucleotide. Um, you understand that um, in order to get um, siRNA and antisense um, picked up by hepatocytes, um, many of them are actually conjugated to GALNAC um, for improvement in uptake. Interestingly, for the GSK um, antisense oligonucleotide, um, the conjugated one actually has lower antiviral efficacy. So they decided to go with the naked one. The naked antisense is um, taken up by macrophages. And it's been postulated that the reason why it works better is maybe it also stimulates innate immune response through toll light receptors. Whether that's true or not, um, still needs to be resolved. In this phase 2B um, B clear study, um, there were two groups of patients. One, they were sta uh, receiving stable new therapy, and one, they were not receiving new therapy, and they did not have concomitant new therapy. Um, so these patients were randomized into four groups with stratified randomization. Group one received from um, the antisense high dose, 300 milligrams, um, for 24 weeks. Group two received a high dose for 12 weeks, and then the lower dose, 150, for another 12 weeks. Group three received 300 milligram dose for only 12 weeks. And group four initially received placebo, and then at week 12, um, started the 300 milligram dose for 12 weeks. So the primary endpoint was service antigen undetectable and HPV DNA not quantifiable, not at the end of treatment, but 24 weeks after end of treatment, because the investigators were ambitious to look for a sustained response. The patients were um, stratified according to the antigen status. Um, and um, actually this should be service antigen, um, less than three log versus um, more than three log. And you can see that group one and group two had the best response. This would be the 300 milligram dose for 24 weeks. This would be 300 milligram dose for 12 weeks followed by 150 milligram dose for 12 weeks. And you can see that in the group that was stable, um, on stable news, um, the response in group one and group two were very similar. Uh, in the group that were not receiving the new therapy, group two had a lower rate of response. And I'll show you additional data. This is breaking it down. So not surprisingly, the patients who had low baseline service antigen, uh, which would be in this group, had higher rate of response than those with um, high baseline service antigen. Not surprisingly, uh, if the service antigen is already low, it's easier to bring it um, all the way down to undetectable. Um, but it is also important to look for any differences in response in Yenogen positive versus Yenogen negative patients. And here, if you focus on group one, the response is definitely higher in Yenogen negative um, patients um, than in Yenogen positive um, patients. Um, in the ones that, have, that are on stable nuke up here, um, this is group one, you have a higher rate of response in the Yenogen negative than in the Yenogen positive patients. 
and the ones that are not on Nuke, the difference is even more striking. The Yandrin negative fund patients, you had a 14% response rate, um, but the Yandrin positive fund patients, no response at all. In fact, um, in the patients not on Nuke, if they were Yandrin positive, regardless of which group, none of the patients um, achieve um, the primary outcome. So despite the fact that some of the investigators claim that this ASO can be used as monotherapy, it definitely is not sufficient for Yandrin positive patients um, if um, you do not use concomitant nuke or other combinations. So this is really plotting out um, the decline in service engine level. Um, this would be um, just the group one patients in whom the best response was observed. Um, on the left-hand side, the patients on stable nuke, and on the right-hand side, the patients not receiving any nuke. At week 24, which is the end of treatment, in green, um, these would be the patients with undetectable surface antigen. And you can see that um, during the post-treatment follow-up, um, some of these patients became surface antigen positive again. In gray would be the um, patients with um, high level, maintained high level of surface antigen. At the end of treatment is a small group, but um, as you follow the patients out, this group becomes um, bigger. Uh, and this difference is more striking for the group not receiving new. Um, this gray bar gets um, even bigger um, as some time goes. Um, so clearly, nuke might still play a role. Now, why does um, nuke play a role? Because if you further dissect the response, remember the primary outcome was undetectable service antigen and unquantifiable DNA. For the patients on nuke, um, the undetectable um, um, service antigen um, was 26%. Undetect, unquantifiable DNA, 90%. But in the patients who are not receiving nuke, the surface antigen appeared to, response appeared to be very similar uh, because the antisense is very effective in knocking down production of surface antigen. But clearly, um, suppression of HPV DNA is muted uh, in the absence of nuke. Um, so again, really indicating that um, the antisense oligonucleotide alone in patients with high baseline DNA, which would be the case in Yandrin positive patients, would be insufficient. Now, I mentioned that uh, the naked a, um, antisense might be um, uptake by the um, macrophages and therefore stimulate um, immune, innate immune response. And it's been observed um, in this particular trial that um, flares in ALT are not uncommon, although none of the patients appear to have any decompensation. So this is profile of one patient, who had a very rapid drop in surface antigen level, and you see a concomitant increase in ALT. And overall, in this particular study, um, ALT flares or ALT elevation were more common among the patients not on nuke. So ALT more than three times upper limit normal in 17% participants on nuke and 41% of those not on nuke. Uh, and ALT flare of more than three times plus bilirubin increase, not observed in anyone on nuke but in two participants, not on new. Um, so again, I think that um, um, new might still play a very important role. Um, so um, what about um, the um, RIF2 um, trial? Um, so that's about um, um, the um, new therapies. Now, this is not exactly trying to test new, um, new therapy, but rather to figure out uh, whether it is, um, it is possible um, to take patients off treatment and what happened after patients are off um, treatment. Um, the Europeans are very hot on stopping new uh, with the belief that it would enhance S antigen loss. So here in the RIF2 trial, they use a combination of the siRNA, um, the capsule assembly modulator and the new. Uh, many of these patients subsequently did not receive the um, CAM because it was found that um, this triple combination is no better than a dual combination. And the control arm received only nuke therapy. Um, these patients, in fact, had been on nuke for eight years prior to entering this particular study. Um, so week 48, they stopped all treatment, including stopping nuke, and they were interested in seeing what happened afterwards. Majority of these patients were Caucasians and not um, Asians. And what you can see is that um, on treatment, um, the nuke only uh, resulted in very low S antigen loss, whereas the siRNA group um, did have a drop in S, um, in S antigen. When you stop the nuke, um, the, um, the placebo group, when you stop all treatment, the placebo group that received nuke only, there was not much um, change and many of these patients resumed um, nuke therapy. 
Interestingly, two patients after resuming nuke, the yellow color are the ones that resume nuke, um, drop the S engine and become undetectable. So it's not the ones that stop treatment completely, but the ones that resume treatment. Fewer patients in the um, siRNA group resume treatment. Um, and um, you can see that um, none of these patients actually clear service engine. Two had a transient drop to undetectable, but then became detectable again. But the more interesting thing is that um, the group that received siRNA, when you take them off treatment, the HBV DNA rebound is not as impressive. Um, and the ALT flare, you don't really see much of the ALT flare. Um, so whether this is actually um, a reason because of the longer duration of siRNA, or whether the siRNA somehow has a better control of the virus so that you don't get the ALT flare is um, unclear. But it is very important to really be careful about stopping treatment because in this particular study, uh, one patient did have a severe flare resulting in liver transplantation. Now, let me talk about another group of compound, the capsid assembly modulators. Um, and this, um, the primary action is to prevent proper assembly of core particles resulting in aberrant or empty core particles, decrease HBV DNA replication, export of virions and production of HBV proteins, prevent proper disassembly of the core particles, and establishment of infection, uh, and decrease recycling. But mechanism two and three, so far, we're not sure whether it works because it requires a high concentration of CAM um, in the new hepatocytes. What we have um, learned is that the combination of CAM with mutes uh, in the orange color here result in um, a sharper drop in HBV DNA and pregenomic RNA but minimal effect on S antigen um, in general is less than half a log decline. And when you take patients off treatment, in general, they will have a universal virological relapse and oftentimes ALT flare as well. Well, then um, people start exploring the combination of triple therapy with siRNA, a CAM and a nuke. In this particular case, the triple combination is in green color, and you can see that the suppressive effect on surface antigen is not as good as siRNA plus nuke alone. Well, it was not clear whether this was a class effect or specifically related to the J and J um, compounds, but it seems that this is a class effect for which we don't understand because this is a different study with the assembly cam plus the um, abutus and siRNA, a different combination. And again, the triple combination and the dual combination, which is um, these two colors, don't seem to make a difference. So this is um, just a nuke um, only, um, and um, this is um, just the um, CAM plus the nuke only, and this is um, the um, siRNA plus the nuke or the siRNA plus the CAM plus the nuke, and they are very similar. So we need to understand why triple combination is not as good as the nuke combination. Now we've heard about the entry inhibitor, bulevitide, uh, which is extensively studied for HDB. There are very little um, data on hepatitis B, monotherapy, um, but as um, Professor Chen mentioned, um, the combination with um, paclitaxel interferon um, would result in some degree of S antigen loss, uh, but not um, S antigen drop, uh, but not the bulevitide alone or bulevitide plus um, um, TDF. But what about the nucleic exit polymers? Um, they have made um, quite a big um, ripple. Um, we don't completely understand how that works, it's supposed to block secretion of um, the subviral particles, but not exactly block virus replication or S antigen production. Uh, small study, 40 patients only. Um, they receive um, TDF um, and um, then um, addition of peclate interferon of TDF um, initially, and then add on the PEC um, plus um, the um, nuclear active polymer. You can see a sharp drop in S antigen, development of anti cess uh, anti HBS. Um, but note that um, these patients develop very marked flare. Although they show that 39% of the patients maintain S antigen loss after stopping treatment, this study was completed several years ago. There's so far been no confirmatory study, so we don't completely understand why, if the results are so impressive, um, there would be no repeat studies. So let me finish by saying, where do we stand here? Um, as I've mentioned, uh, we need to suppress virus replication then we need to decrease antigen production. Um, and in some patients, we might need to have immune modulatory therapy um, to boost the immune response. The big um, questions that we have right now is, which ones do we combine together? Um, and um, how, is, um, how do we eliminate 
or silence integrated HBV DNA. When we see a drop in S antigen, but we don't get some clearance, is it because the integrated HBV DNA continue to make S antigen? And how do we actually attack that? Um, how do we know which patient has immune recovery and therefore don't need immune modulatory therapy and which patients need it? Um, do we know which arm of the immune response we need to stimulate? Um, those are big questions. Um, because uh, we haven't actually made a lot of um, progress in achieving functional cure, some people are even asking, um, is um, the current definition too ambitious? Uh, is it feasible? Uh, and um, we're still in the debate at this moment. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention um, and for inviting me to join you today. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, Professor Analog and the excellent talk. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, one of the panelists, uh, uh, Professor George Lau, have some have, uh, some point key point uh, to discuss about uh, the uh, new uh, antiviral therapy for HIV. So, uh, Professor Lau, please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Minglong. Uh, this is really a wonderful Friday night uh, to hear uh, so uh, you know, very informative uh, uh, discovery and innovations uh, prospects uh, from uh, key speakers. Um, I'm uh, very um, impressed uh, with the recent developments with the new compounds for hepatitis B. And I would like to uh, draw to your attention uh, of uh, some of the key issues, This, per which makes me perplexed. and. Uh, want to share with you and ask whether, whether what is your comment on this. Um, this is the slide shown by the Professor Anna Locke. Anna, I would like to call her Anna because I know her and I, I truly respect her for a long period of time. And uh, suffice to say, this is a randomized studies uh, and the key inclusion criteria is, uh, is labeled here, service antigen greater than 100 international units per meal. And this is a randomized studies uh, with stratifications uh, according to the status. Yes. Are you... Can you share the slides? Yes, I'm trying to share the slides. Uh, can you see the slides? Uh, yes, please. Yes. <clears throat> I think this is uh, exciting uh, studies. Um, well, well, we all like to have uh, to see functional cure. But I have a, a question so after going through the details of the studies. Uh, this is the GSKB clear studies, uh, making use of the anti-science oligos uh, NICT, um, in, the subgroup, in a group of patients with chronic hepatitis B. This is a randomized studies so with stratifications according to the e antigen status and baseline service energy level. Now, but this is, um, of it's really perplexed me when I read the, the details of the studies. Now we have all heard about the nine percent uh, encouraging uh, results of reaching the endpoint, which is a functional cure twenty four weeks after the end of therapy. And uh, in the two groups of patients uh, who received uh, this anti science oligonucleotide for for twenty four weeks. This 9% is regarded significant difference. However, if you look into the details of the studies at week eight and week 12, uh, in all three groups of patients, which is being shown here, all three groups received the same dose with the same intervals of 12 weeks of this antisense oligonucleotides. As shown the orange, 16% 16, 16 achieved the endpoint, 21% uh, we achieved the endpoints in another group and 9%. So we are talking about a difference which range and can reach 12%. And if 9% is considered significant, then this 12% must be considered significant. And this really perplexed me. This is a randomized study. So with all the confounding factors should be the considered. And we, are, we should be seeing the effect of the drug itself. So my questions to um, the speakers and the panelists and uh, others, my the respectful colleagues here, is whether there is another confounding factor that we are missing over here. Because uh, we have tried to get the functional cure. Maybe 
if we can find this confounding factors, not the drug itself, which is affecting the response, we might uh, go to uh, well, major um, another breakthrough uh, in the cure for hepatitis B. So this is um, my point after going through the papers published uh, in, pre in press in the Journal of Medicine. Well, maybe um, I can make a comment. Um, we can always pick bits and pieces of a trial and find discrepancies. Um, and um, you're very sharp in sort of saying that um, at a 12 week time point, um, they should, they all receive the same therapy. Why do you have different results? Um, in the randomized trial, you try to make sure that the groups are balanced, but there are actually multiple factors. They did um, do a stratification um, into um, the E antigen positive versus the E antigen positive in the baseline surface antigen. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are also sort of minor differences. Uh, for example, some of these patients um, that are on stable nukes, some of them are not on the nuke. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember that um, figure, whether that's a combination of um, people on nuke and uh, not on nuke or whether that's some sort of um, separate because they had like 20 supplementary figures and tables. Yes. And it really take a couple of hours to read through the entire paper and understand all the supplementary tables and figures. Um, because the one thing that I really got away from that um, paper, uh, when you listen to the authors, everything is hunky dory um, but there's a big difference in response between the antigen positive and the antigen negative patients. Right. And the ones on nuke and the ones not on nuke. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing that um, the authors keep saying, oh, we can use monotherapy. That's really not the case. Mm -hmm. Unless you have been on nuke, um, you have your e antigen negative, you already have suppressed DNA, very low S antigen, maybe antisense alone uh, would be sufficient. But for the majority of these patients, uh, where your S antigen level is still high or your DNA is high, I don't think so. And even uh, for those favorable patients, um, as I've um, tried to show you, 24 mm -hmm. weeks post-treatment, you begin to see gradual return of S antigen. And I expect that 48 weeks post-treatment, um, the relapse rate would be even higher. Um, the reason why, there's a big difference when you stop new, mm -hmm. new just suppress the DNA replication. You stop the treatment, the virus DNA should back very quickly. Right. SIRNA and antisense, um, their effect lasts for many months. Right. So when you stop treatment, you don't get an immediate rebound. And even six months after stopping treatment, you have not seen the full return of the virus. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And even FDA has been saying that for some of these therapies, maybe conditional approval if they show sustained response um, six months after stopping treatment, but the real test might be one year after stopping treatment or longer. Right. Um, and all of the phase three trials would require a rollover into registry where you can subsequently look at um, two years, three years, four years um, to really truly determine durability. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Anna. So uh, is there any question uh, from the audience or the panelists? Oh, for uh, Professor Anna Locke's talk. Well, in fact, uh, if you allow me, I would like to continue some of the discussion because this is a very important topic about functional cure. You define this as 24 weeks after treatment. Now we are talking about SIRA. We are using new methods to, uh, uh, to see the response and whether really the 24 weeks is adequate because they, at the end of the day, we want to benefit our patients. We want to take them off from mutes with service energy clearance. Uh, we want to achieve a real functional cure. They remain service energy negative. But uh, if the effect uh, might uh, uh, happen so after 24 weeks, as you have uh, pointed out, uh, then uh, these definitions might not be um, applicable. Uh, well, for what we have learned in the, in the natural history studies and in the, in the previous treatments with, uh, with the interferons and also mutes. So what would be your opinions on this aspect? Because then I don't want my patients to come back two years down the road and said, that, well, we have received treatments and then I have my service energy positive again and then uh, come back with problems. Well, I think that you need to be able to walk 
before you run, right? Um, if you can't even um, get estrogen to be undetectable at the end of treatment, then you don't talk about durability. If you can't get estrogen, maintain estrogen loss 24 weeks after stopping treatment, you can't talk about 48 weeks after stopping treatment. So it's really one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And I hope, Josh, you have learned from me that mm -hmm. when we manage patients with chronic hepatitis B, we never tell our patient, oh, you're cured, you're done, say goodbye, I never need to see you again. Mm -hmm. Now, we always um, tell the patients, uh, this is a chronic disease. Right. Um, we might be able to push the virus into a corner, and mm -hmm. it might stay in a corner for a long time, right. but it doesn't mean that it's completely gone. Um, and even for patients who spontaneously lost S antigen, um, I congratulate them. I say, you won a lottery, but please remember one day, if you ever receive, require immunosuppressive therapy, right. that virus might still come back. Right. Just make sure that if your doctors in the future put you on these um, treatment, uh, you remember that and uh, you bring it up. Um, so you, you shouldn't be telling your patients, hey, I mean, I cure you. Bye, um, because um, that would um, get them um, into trouble. I totally agree with you. Uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, something that uh, is of my concern with the current momentum. And I, I think that uh, we need to look at the data very carefully before we can uh, uh, push forward so, to benefit our patients. So thank you, Anna, again. Thank you. So uh, we still have um, that three minutes. So. There's uh, one question uh, in, uh, from the audience for Professor Peter Chen. Uh, Professor Chen, uh, the one, uh, Dr. Mikai does study. He asked, uh, what is the treatment option for the prevention of HDV recurrence after liver transplantation? Professor Peter Chen, are you still online? Okay. Um, may I ask a question to Professor Anerluk? Sure. Um, um, very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm um, Young Seok Lim from um, South Korea. And uh, so far, uh, it seems um, clear that the uh, use of siRNA or ASO um, should be the backbone or cornerstone um, in the your treatment to induce the uh, functional cure. However, so far, most of the trials have tried for 24 weeks of treatment, but it seems uh, that the uh, longer treatment duration with siRNA or ASO may induce a greater reduction in S antigen levels. Um, so um, I think I want to hear uh, your opinion about that. Um, so I've um, also shown you some data of um, siRNA used for 48 weeks. Um, there is a difference between siRNA and ASO in terms of mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. uh, with um, siRNA, um, we see a sharp drop in S antigen within the first um, 12 weeks or so. And then it reaches a plateau as week 16 to 20. So even though you keep dosing, um, it just um, stays at a low level. It doesn't drop further. And it's not clear what the reason is. Is it because we saturate the system? Um, is it, um, should we be pausing and give another dose um, after a longer period of time? That's something that still needs to be resolved. The ASO so far is really the GSK um, um, ASO that has been studied extensively. Uh, and we don't have data on other ASO. Um, this ASO is very interesting because it's not Galnet conjugated. They actually had a galnet conjugated one, which was thought to be better because it's better taken up by hepatocyte. But in the early um, trials, it was actually not as effective. And so this particular ASO might be working more as an immune modulatory therapy. Um, that's why you see the flares in the ALT um, because this postulator is taken up by the macrophages, not by the hepatocytes. So it's more of an immune modulatory therapy. I think it's, um, we still have a lot of things that we need to learn. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we have around the time and uh, I'd like to, uh, to stop uh, the penalty second here. And uh, I would like to make the uh, closing uh, remark. So uh, 
uh, tonight uh, we have uh, three uh, excellent uh, speakers, speakers uh, talking about the new biomarker for the management of HBV, uh, the new uh, paradigm of the uh, HDB management, and also the hope of the new HBV agents uh, targeting the H functional cure. So I would like to uh, thank all the three speakers and uh, the moderator as well as the panelists for your uh, uh, active participation in the Apaso uh, Pathology webinar episode six. So I hope you, uh, all of you and the, the audience enjoyed the uh, speech very much. So uh, thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.